Buenas tardes. My name is Jesus Alvarez, also known as Jesse, a.k.a. Chuy, and also the hood name Gordo from Salas or Salinas. I wasn't born here, but I was raised here. I was born in Calexico, Calexico California. And that's a little bit interesting because uh, as I was growing up, if you were from uh, born down south, you would consider it as, as a southerner. But because I was raised up in Salinas, I was considered as a northerner. So at the time when I was growing up, going through the institution, uh, I grew up, when I was going through Hawaii, when I was growing up, they would say, hey, what are you, a northerner or southerner? And uh, really, we weren't going through too much of that because there wasn't a whole lot of uh, Chicanos around in YA at the time, so we stuck together. So we started hearing that, it was like, we didn't really get into it too much. They were playing that more in prison than what they did in YA. So later on, as we got older, uh, the youngsters used to ask you, what do you claim, northern or southerner? And I tell them, you know what, man? I'm a jalapeno. What? Norteño, sureño, I said, I'm a jalapeno. And they go, what's that? I'm still a Chicano, man. I, 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 from both sides, man. I was born down south, I was raised up north. So, you know, I'm in between. And so they kind of tripped out. But as I was growing up, uh, as a youngster, uh, in Salinas, uh, my mom was um, worked hard in, in uh, packing sheds. She worked in the fields. Uh, I remember that. Uh, I was uh, growing up in the projects. Uh, a lot of the kids there didn't have a dad. I never knew my dad. So I grew up without a father. My mom did have some boyfriends down then. They treated me pretty good. But I grew up as a, a young guy without a dad, but my uncles, my grandfather, they, they treated me pretty good. My brother, he treated me like, uh, like, a, like a dad in a way since he was 18 years older than I was. But So I got some uh, uh, leadership from kind of like a dad from my brother. He taught me how to play baseball, uh, he taught me how to work, he taught me how to drive. But the other way I learned how to drive was uh, me and my friends used to go steal cars from the parking lots, from the car lots. And so that's when we learned how to drive until we got caught and we'd go in the boys race behind that. But uh, my mom was also an alcoholic. She would drink for about three to six months on benches. She would get sobered up for a while. When she was sober, she was hard working when she was drinking, she would uh, be miserable. And she didn't know about AA. I didn't know about AA, I was young. I used to go shine shoes in Chinatown. That's Chinatown now, is, well, there's a lot of homeless people, a lot of uh, drug dealers, a lot of uh, uh, people out there uh, just kind of running amok. But at that time when Chinatown was around, there was a lot of bars, a few restaurants, uh, a lot of prostitution, a lot of gambling. There was uh, a lot of soldiers going out there uh, looking for uh, some action, so to say. There's a lot of a lot of prostitution going on. I'd go out there and shine shoes. And, you know, that was my hustle. As 10, 11, 12 years old, I'd go shine shoes. There's a lot of pimps out there, and uh, you know, they 25 cents. You know, they'd give me a dollar, sometimes two dollars. Touch them up on their shoes, you know. Made my own shoebox. Uh, I'd get out there, and at times my mom would be drinking at the bar. I'd go look for her, you know, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and I'd take her home. And uh, they'd make her go home because kids couldn't be in the bar. So I see a lot of things going on there people fighting, uh, getting stabbed, people uh, doing a lot of crazy stuff out there. So as I got older, you know, uh, hanging around with the people that uh, kind of had things familiar with my life, you know, we kind of bonded and blended together, got into little gangs with the 
bicycle game it's called the uh, Papa's Helper, and the other game was the Stompers, and there was another game called the Soul Brothers. So we got into action like that where we would fight with each other, and eventually we got along down the road. I went to a school called the Ellis Cell Junior High, and I used to go to Washington, and then what happened was we uh, get run across each other, and uh, we ended up fighting each other. Except for the Soul Brothers, we I got along real good with them. Uh, but it was the Stompers that we got to hassle with. Eventually, I ended up moving from the west side to the east side, and then uh, I started going to also saw junior high, and I'm getting fights all the time, because, uh, you know, I was considered their enemy. You know, some of these guys, I used to go to school with them, uh, in grammar school, a lot of them, and so eventually, every day, I was getting fights almost, for about almost two months. And uh, sometimes I get out of school, I take a try to find a, uh, the long way home. And some of the guys caught on, they still I fight. And sometimes when I knew I was outnumbered, man, I didn't stick around and ran, you know. If it was one on one or maybe one and two, I'd, I'd stick around and fight with them. But when there was too many, you know, uh, I was gonna be no dumb and be somebody's punching bag. But as time went on, you know, I guess the guys that, they realized that, you know, that I would fight them. And then the Soul Brothers started backing me up, you know. They started seeing, hey, man, you know, we see these guys giving you hassle. We're going to stick up, you know, stick up for you. So they started sticking up with, up for me, helping me out when I started getting fights. So these guys made peace with me, the Stompers, so they called them the Stompers. And uh, made peace with them. And next thing you know, started getting in trouble with them stealing bikes and burglarizing and doing things and you know my mom would get get drunk and you know and get in trouble because she wasn't around at that time she was at the bar or she would be home drunk and this time she was sober and so things happened where I got started getting incarcerated. The thing was I wouldn't go to school and I wasn't a dummy. I, I would get good grades when I did go to school. But, you know, things turned around in my life where I got quite a bit of trouble. And, uh, you know, I just took advice at times, but I listened, then I didn't listen. And eventually what took place was uh, I started uh, going down the road where going to different institutions, uh, Boys Ranch, uh, Boys School in Hollister, the two that Boys we had boys' schools now called uh, Rancho Cielo. Then I went to boys' school in Hollister. Now it's not there no longer. It's close to where uh, they made that movie, uh, La Bamba, Southside Park. There's a little school there. And then from there, it uh, was interesting. I did 13 months. And I got out. My mom was uh, really beginning depressed because it was too much for her to see me getting locked up quite a bit. I went to foster home and things like that. So it took place and my mom got so de depressed that her way of dealing with depression was drinking. And uh, they had told her when, when I got, uh, had done some time before that, if she drank again, that she would uh, most likely die because she had cirrhosis. So. On December 22nd, 1969, we were taking reds, me and some friends, and uh, we ended up getting pretty loaded on it. Me and this other friend named Benny, he passed away a few years back. He fell asleep in the back seat of this car, a 55 Chevy that these girls had. And I fell asleep in the front seat. And you know, those old cars, sometimes you, you, they have missing parts. Well, the window wouldn't roll down because sometimes the, 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 the knob for the window would fall out and uh, couldn't open the door because that, that, the knob was gone too. So the only way you could get out was, uh, there was only two doors to roll the window down so when you're all loaded on reds, you're not thinking, right? It's like you're more drunk, you're drunker than the skunk by just taking the reds. It's, uh, 
the second order to take the barbiturates, so to say. So this one guy took the car where we were asleep with the girls, and he went to, to this little store out there in uh, Bulls and Nose, and he breaks a window at the store, and he takes two TVs, color TVs, small ones, puts them in the front seat. I wake up, I hear all this noise, alarm going on, and I look and I say, hey, what the heck are you doing, man? He goes, don't trip, I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll, I'll give you a cut. A cut, I don't want nothing, man. Let me out of this car, man, you know? Cause I knew, I, was, I just got out, I barely had two months out. And uh, he was, he jumped in the car and he took off. And next thing you know, he gets out towards the freeway. Then he gets on going towards Market Street. By that time, we got sheriffs behind us. We got CHP. And when he gets off on Market Street, uh, next thing you know, there's uh, Salinas PD coming on Market Street. He gets off, crosses it, and uh, he, then he turns off at this West Street and parks right by his house, jumps out of the car, doesn't open the door for us, and runs into his house. Then he's in the back, all knocked out. I'm all tore up by him, but I, I see him. So I'm trying to open the, trying to find a thing to open the, to roll down the window, and uh, next thing you know, we got shotguns on us, guns and everything. He says, don't, don't move. I can't move, I can't even open the door. So next thing you know, I'm busted. I'm telling my friend, Benny, Benny, wake up. Next thing you know, the cops are getting him, and we're arrested, you know, for burglary. And uh, since we weren't driving, they tell who's the driver? I, could, I don't know who the driver is. I knew who the driver is. And then even Benny knew, but Benny didn't know he was driving. So we go to juvenile hall and uh, we're getting arrested for something we really didn't do. But we can't tell. You know the code, can't snitch. Ain't no snitch. Still am the snitch. You know, and uh, that was stayed by the code, you know, the, the neighborhood. Can't be a snitch. So here Benny and I go to Juvenile Hall. Mom caught wind of it right around Christmas time. She comes to visit me. She's drunk. And uh, the staff there didn't let her ha didn't let her see me with the rest of the uh, the the guys there, you know, because the condition she was in. So I had to visit her on someplace else in the hallway. And uh, she was telling me she didn't want to live. And her condition, I didn't want to see her like that. I told her, don't come visit me if you're going to be like that. You know, I was embarrassed. You know, and those are the last words I had. remember telling her, I go, don't come like that if you're going to be drunk, you know, in Spanish I was telling her. And those words kind of haunt me because that was the last word I told her. Instead of telling her I love you, please don't do it no more. And I, I wish I would have told her that, but I didn't. But I still love her, you know, I miss her. And, uh, you know, a few days later, uh, she got sick. Her liver kicked in, it was failing. I went to go see her at the hospital. Uh, she had tubes all on her nose. And she, she had IVs and, and then the following day they called me again. This time they, they didn't dress me out, they just took me my Levi's and sweat tennis shoes from the juvenile hall. And I got there and see everybody's crying. And I see them, I ran into the room, my mom's just laying there, no tubes, nothing. And right there I knew she was dead, I didn't even get to talk to her anymore at all, you know, and that's kind of one of the sad things. So they let me out, but eventually uh, I went back to court and because I didn't tell him who the driver was, you know, or Benny didn't say, he went to Boyd's Ranch in Southern California Youth Authority. So there I go, you know, and they went on pro. Uh, did some time. And then I got out, went back in about a year and a half later, 
uh, gladiator school. Went back into what I got violated. Uh, you know, I learned a trade there. We learned how to, to sew, how to iron, and, and the laundry. And, you know, went to school the second time. And so I learned some things there. Learned how to do crime a little bit better. But, you know, uh, I still didn't want to get involved with to doing a gang thing. I just, I couldn't see myself uh, uh, fighting uh, my homeboys, uh, fighting the same kind of the race. I didn't, I think I couldn't see that. So I ended up getting, eventually I ended up getting out on parole when I got out the second time. Uh, my family kept on me, you need to get married, you need to do this, you need to do that. And so um, I met somebody eventually I ended up getting married when I really shouldn't have gotten married at the time. I think I was still too young. And, uh, you know, I started using uh, drugs because it was an easy way to make money. I was working, but I was trying to make money the fast way. I know sometimes I, I've gone to, to, uh, to the schools and we share with kids certain things about people trying to make money the easy way. And so, you know, try to come up real easy, come up like seven up. And eventually what happened is uh, when, you, when you're when you selling product and you're using the product, well, you're not gonna come up, you're gonna come down, you know? So that's a bad experience, you know? Using your product just to survive, just to stay well. So there's never a way to, to make money. So that ended up happening quite a few times. So through that, uh, I ended up getting arrested, and later on, uh, through my wife, I went to Mexico, uh, trying to score down there, and I got busted down there, and I'm going to prison in Mexico, which wasn't a pleasant thing. The prison in Mexico was a whole different story. I got there, I was there a month, felt like I was there a year. As soon as you walk in, they want to take your shoes, take your once they take your pants, you know what they want, you know? They want your backside too. I said, no, man. You know, I backed up to, to the wall by a corner and said, you know, I'm going to go down, man, because I, I ain't going down like that. I'm going to fight my way. I just happened to have a friend that was there seen it, and he was, when he was on Nolo, he was a prison champ boxer. I said, hey, you mess with me, you know, stuck up for me, man. You know, he got my stuff, man. And, my shoes, yeah, I took my shoes, but once he wanted my pants too, and he had to sit down, man, he gave me up my pants. And uh, so anyways, he stuck up for me, he got, got my pant, my shoes back, my t-shirt back, and uh, you know, he helped me out for the month I was there, man, but you know, if you don't have no money, you're jacked up. So anyways, eventually I got out of there, hey, I got deported from Mexico. <laughs> That's interesting. You know, people get deported for the United States, but I got deported for Mexico. But I have felonies because I was doing burglaries on the other side over here in the United States. So I got busted for some burglaries, so I, I, you know, I had got bailed out. So, you know, bail company, the bail people, they wanted to make sure they didn't want to lose their money. So they extradited me. So then they deported me, they picked me up, sent me to jail in Calexico. Then I went to, uh, of Central, and when I went in there, I see he and me all over the place. And I go, oh man, I better act like I don't, I, you know, I don't know no English, because I'm in trouble, because I got solace on my, on my forearm, and I'm a target there. So, for five days, I, I just spoke Spanish, and uh, when the day I was leaving, they called my name, and I go, yeah, I'm here. And the guys all tripped out. They go, Hey, you speak English? I go, yeah. I rolled it up and I go, where you from, Salinas? Oh, man, you're lucky, man. Oh, man, this guy's from, oh, no, oh, man, I was lucky, man. I, you know, I didn't play that, you know, just because I'm from Salinas, man. They would have, I don't think I would have been, been walking out of there. Probably would have dragged me in a stretcher. But thank God he was there for me, man, all this time. And I left, did time, got out. Uh, went to San Jose, got a job there, ended up get working with Lowrider Magazine. I worked a few, few pack. Always tried to do something different to make my life better. But you know what? It wasn't. Even joined the Navy from there. Went around the world. 
you know, for about five years. Traveled and, you know, seen the world a little bit. Ended up getting divorced with my ex-wife, had a little boy. And they had a little girl before I went overseas. And I uh, tried to do something different, man, but you know, uh, it was it was nice joining the Navy, seeing the world, doing something. Like, you know, it would help me to learn to be more responsible, help me to, to be more aware of things. But, you know, I was looking for something, you know. I was trying to fill something in because something was empty, you know. And uh, when I got back, you know, I found out that what was empty was my heart. And the only thing that could fill that up was the Lord. So after I got out, you know, I almost, I was ready to kill my wife, my ex-wife, we would get back together. She, you know, we were in the room, I, I was trying to win her, she had up getting strung out uh, while I was in the service and tried to get back with her. And, and uh, just she had me pulling a trick while I was in the house, in one of the rooms. And I go, hey, what are you doing? She goes, oh, nothing. And I go open the door. She goes, no, oh, I can hear this guy in there. So I went, I went and got my gun from the, the car, I loaded it up and I was going, going to knock the door down. My kids are saying, don't kill my mom, dad, dad, please, please, dad, don't kill me. And they're hanging on to my leg and stuff. And, and I, I get open this door. And when I kicked the door open, the guy was really going out the door. And because uh, I was going to shoot him first, then shoot her. So that was my mindset. So I didn't shoot her yet. So. Then I went outside to go shoot it. He was it, jumped in his car, he was gone. And then I was walking back in and my kids were yelling, please, daddy, please, and that. My mind just kind of clicked. They go, what am I doing? I can't shoot her in front of my kids. You know, it'll mess up their mind. It'll mess my mind up. Then I, she took the kids and left. And I went to the room, sat down, had the gun. I go, what's the purpose of this living? I might as well end it. So I had the gun, I was gonna just put it in my chin and just, just end it. And, uh, but I did it. And you know, what's interesting is that I saw a crucifix and I heard a voice. I see Jesus, you know, he was there. But I heard a voice, says, if you do that, you'll never go to heaven. I go, well, I don't wanna go to hell. Then I thought about it, you know, I had a chance to die before, before I joined the Navy. I had a guy shot in the face by my ex, uh, my, my ex wife's mother's boyfriend. It was at a fiesta in the Secret Mile in 1979 or 78. And I heard somebody say, F you, Jesse. And I turned around. I didn't see nothing. Next thing you know, I'm in a van spitting out blood and teeth. And I'm going, Wow, man, what, what they hit me with? Homeboys, these guys are looking at me. And they go, with that weird looking face, you know, I mean, what's wrong, man? They go, oh, man, you didn't get hit at home because we used to fight, you know, we used to fight. We didn't, you know, be shooting people. And he goes, oh, homeboy, you got shot. Shot, yeah. Where? In the head. And they go, whoa, and passed out. And then when I was got in the hospital, you know, the doctors are there, and they go, oh, man, you know, they're trying to hook me up and all that, and they're saying, you know, we're losing them, we're losing them. You know, my wife was, ex-wife was there, but after she was still my wife then, with the, she wasn't crying or anything, she just looking at me like, why don't you just die? You know, one of those kind of looks. But you know what? I remember, because I, I used to be at a uh, boys' school, we used to have Bible studies, and this old man used to sing with us. He walks with me and he talks with me, he tells me I am his old in the garden, right? And at that time, he used to tell us that Jesus loved us. And he said, call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. So he said, we're losing them, we're losing them. I started blacking out. And I remember just saying, help me, Jesus. Forgive me, I'm sorry, God. I don't wanna die. And I go, help me, Jesus, and I passed out. Three days later, I woke up, my jaws like locked. I can't eat, I lost some teeth. For about six months, I couldn't I had a drink out of a straw as time went on. A year later is when I joined the Navy. So when I had that gun, I, all those things came to pass to me and I said, you know what? There's gotta be something more in life. So a few, about a month later, not even few, about three weeks later, I went down to LA, went to Selma, visited a friend of mine, and I was on the railroad tracks. And I was thinking, man, I didn't even give God a chance. 
And I heard a voice say, what's wrong with right now? A couple of times I thought of my friend saying it. So he says, no, no, you're tripping, man. You're smoking too much PCP. So, you know, I got on my knees and asked Jesus, you know, if you're for real, you know, forgive me. I didn't ask him to show me his rights. He says, please forgive me. Because I knew I was a sinner. I knew I needed to be forgiven. And I, I started crying like a baby. You know, I didn't even cry when my mom died. But I was I was mad at God. I didn't hate him, but I was mad. Because he took my mom away when I was 15 years old. But I cried like a baby, but when I got up, I felt clean. My, I twisted my ankle. In the morning, my ankle wasn't even twisted, went to church. But as time went on, you know what? I ended up going to prison again. God changed my life. I went to church, uh, learned about the Lord. God started doing a work in my life. I backslid, started working with Lowrider Magazine again. Uh, went back to the world, but you know what? I ended up getting in trouble again, selling drugs, working at a hotel. And uh, what's interesting is on uh, in, in uh, February 7, 1997, uh, I worked at a hotel and I got busted. And I really didn't get busted or arrested. I got rescued. I was asked God to help me, but not to go to jail. But God has a way of doing things. He got a hold of my attention. And I went to jail, ended up getting prison time. I got out, I did 20 months, no over 20, close to 24 months. Got out, and uh, since then, you know, uh, I haven't gone back to using. And God's been good to me. And since then, I've been doing ministry, which happened now. And what's interesting is now that, that I've been a chaplain, God's been uh, using my life to Minister, I go into the prison now to minister there. I go to Juno Hall. I, I, I haven't gotten it now because of the COVID, but I go to the youth center. And what's interesting, when I was going to the prison, I met my, my friend Danny, you know, in 2000, uh, 2010. He, I went to, well, 2000, yeah, 2008. I met him at the, at the SAP program. I was a counselor there. And in 2008, it was interesting. It was a uh, ended up going to get another job too, as a really as a community resource coordinator for the PAC meetings. And then I was able to do the celebrate recovery and say at the prison in 2010. Then Danny came along again, and some of the other brothers, and uh, been able to do that for quite a few years now. And uh, Danny got out, and he started doing uh, work in the community, going to college and stuff. And and I've been able to get to go with them to Watsonville and minister uh, in a sense where high schools and the young kids out there and uh, really end up giving them a heads up about what's really going on when they're in school. Because one of the percentages is that uh, the kids, if they don't complete at least the ninth grade, they end up dropping out. So. You know, and I remember myself because I didn't even had two weeks in ninth grade. So I know I'm one of those statistics. I dropped out. But thank God that I ended up going back later on. And I graduated, got my high school diploma. But I got my high school diploma in jail. But that's okay. I got it, you know. But encouraging young people to stay in school. So they, you know, I tell them, hey, you want to be cool? Stay in school, otherwise you become a fool. So, you know, right now it's, uh, the testimony that I, I share is that God has filled in that emptiness in my life. He's given me a chance to have a family, another family again. Uh, my wife, I, I met her through my brother-in-law. He was uh, writing, I had the prison ministry at the church I was at. Uh, so the church, uh, I met his his mom, his, sister, his mom, his, her dad, and I met my wife there, his dad, and through my brother-in-law, his sister's now, you know, his sister is my wife, and we got married the same day, so it's a double wedding, and so, see my t-shirt, it says, I'm a blessed man, 
God has blessed me. But I want to share something before I end this uh, this uh, testimony. You know, one of the things that, that God has showed me also was that in Matthew 6, 33, when I first got saved, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be added unto you. So, one of the things that I, God has showed me also is that he gives us a choice. It says in, in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5, it says, now I'm going to read out the contemporary English version. It says, I, the Lord, have put a curse on those who turn from me and trust in human strength. They will dry up like a bush in safety, in salty desert soil where nothing can go. But I will bless those who trust me. They will be like a, trees growing beside a stream, trees with the roots that reach down deep to the water and will its leaves that are always green. They bear fruit each year and are never worried by the lack of rain. You people of Judah are so deceitful, you even fool yourselves and can't even change. But I know the deeds and your thoughts, and I will make you get what you deserve. In other words, you know, when it says, you, you know, if God desires to give you what you ask for. If you want a curse, he'll give you a curse. If you trust in yourself or you trust just as man. Well, you trust in him, and he'll bless you. So we have a choice. You trust yourself, trust in man, you ask him for a curse. You trust God, you ask your blessing. I mean, you can trust, like, your dad, you can trust your wife, you know. That kind of trust is cool. But when you just rather trust somebody else and not trust God, well, you know, you put yourself in the spot. But trust the Lord with all your heart, you know. And don't lean just on your own understanding, but on all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. So that's part of, that's my testimony to you, that trust God with all your heart, man. You know, I had to learn the hard way. I'm 67 now. You got to be willing. Maybe I'll have another 20 or even 30 years. You know, so don't give up, man. Thank you. God bless you.